All right, guys, welcome to chapter five, developmental views of delinquency. So last week we had our sociological views and this week we're talking about developmental views. So developmental theories um, start to look at some of the um, beginning parts of the onset of delinquency. And so we're gonna look at some different theories and you can see here at these um, independent yet interrelated views that we're gonna go through. We're gonna talk about the life course theory, latent trait theory, and trajectory theory. So let's start with the life course view. So life course, theories attempt to integrate social, personal, and, envir and environmental factors into these explanations of the onset and persistence of a delinquent career. So it is a developmental theory and it really focuses on changes in behavior as people travel along their course of their lifetime. And how do those changes then affect crime and delinquency? So it suggests that <clears throat> family and um, jobs and peers all influence that behavior. Just like you see on the slide here, you know, if there's positive like life experiences that may help kids desist from delinquency so it's it's important to understand that we know that um, that people change over the course of their lives and we know that they have multiple traits that go into that and so that can be social traits or psychological traits or economic traits. So the Gluck research, which is um, focused on the early onset of delinquency as, a, um, as kind of a telling part of having a delinquent career. And what they noted is that children who are antisocial early on in life are the most likely to continue that those offending careers into adulthood into adulthood so you can see here on the slide the most important factor was family relationships family relationships family relationships and so i want you to think about that if family relationships are in fact one of the biggest pieces in keeping kids to not be delinquent or not continue on with delinquent behavior, then it makes pretty good sense that the majority of those that are in prison have super high A scores. Just kind of store that and when we get into, in a few weeks we get into, uh, we'll talk about childhood trauma and resilience. So you can see there are some other um, different areas that they talk about are important as well. So then we move into life course concepts. And there are a number of key concepts that help define the life course view. So age of onset, problem behavior syndrome, and continuity of, continuity of crime and delinquency. So age of onset, what we're talking about is, you know, early onset. And this is a view that kids who begin engaging in antisocial behaviors at a very early age are going to be the ones most at risk for a delinquent career. All right. And so there was different research that was done. Um, the Cambridge study did some research in delinquent um, development. There was um, an idea about or a concept called problem behavior syndrome. And with problem behavior syndrome, is there a slide that goes over this? Yeah, here it is. Um, with problem behavior syndrome, what they found was these behaviors, um, which include family dysfunction, substance abuse, smoking, precarious sexuality, early pregnancy, um, underachievement, like educational underachievement, suicide attempts, um, seeking sensations, and unemployment. Those were, um, those were all kind of part of that life course view and these life course concepts 
that had effects on these um, juveniles continuing their delinquency. So um, huge thing, continuity of crime delinquency, the best prediction Dictor of future criminality is past criminality, and I, I you know, that's a, a saying that the best predictor of the future is looking at the past. And so we know that these kids that continue to persist and engage in these aggressive acts, um, continually involved in thefts or violent offenses, as they start to enter adulthood, they then have less support. And we see this, and this happens, less support, lower job satisfaction, distant peer relationships, and psychiatric problems. And so it's important to understand that link. Um, and that's going to start to make more and more sense as we get further into this course. So age-graded theory is um, a theory that suggests that if you build social capital, and strong social bonds, there is a strong likelihood um, that there will be a reduction in long-term deviance, okay? So when we're talking about that, we're talking about building up your social bonds, and that's gonna help to get kids out of this delinquent behavior, and we talk about reduces the likelihood of long-term deviance. So, um, most uh, one of the most prominent of these is age graded theory. So this was one of these um, um, sy systematic theories that talked about this, these different ones. So you can see how these are all kind of interrelated, but they are independent. Um, so it was first articulated in an important 1993 um, work. It was called Crime in the Making by Sampson and Lobb. Um, again, 1993, and you can see this very, very interactive slide, or not really interactive, but busy slide, um, that you guys are welcome to come back to and look at how this works, because you can kind of see how everything is related and how it all plays out. Um, I'm not gonna dissect this on in a lecture, but there are turning points that occur in the life course. So um, different criminologists have formulated these systematic theories and they kind of go along with all of this and how that goes together. So, um, so when we talk about life events and there are turning points in people's lives that are important for um, delinquency to stay away. And really these life events can produce formal and informal social controls. And because of that, that will restrict criminality and delinquency. And so Long Samson and Lobb identified these as turning points. And there are two critical turning points in life. Career, a career, having goals and being able to follow through with those and marriage. So we know um, that stability that's brought through love can be a primary conduit of informal social control. Stability brought through love can be a primary conduit of informal social control. So um, the stability that, that having love in your life can bring um, goes so far beyond just being in love. It really can bring some social control. Um, it can help to fill emotional gaps that maybe one has experienced in their childhood. Um, and so it really helps to um, discourage offending by strengthening the social bond. I will tell you... Um, from working for the Department of Corrections, when people would get out of prison or jail, when they had good positive role models or a partner who was, you know, doing the right thing, as they would say, you know, my, my girlfriend, she's, you know, she's, she's a normal chick. She does the right thing. Um, 
when they have that, it really helps them to build social capital and make some better, um, make some better decisions. Um, so again, we're talking about this development of social capital. Um, and really this is a cornerstone of these age, gra age graded theories is this influence of social capital on behavior. So here is your definition, social capital, positive relations with individuals and institutions that support conventional behavior and inhibit deviant behavior. So let's think about that. I mean, school, church, maybe um, boys and girls club, different types of institutions or um, systems like that. So I think you guys get that idea. Oops, going the wrong way here. So, um, we talked about this and I, I know I kind of got ahead of us, but, but I just want you guys to remember, you know, these things, the development of a positive career and then marriage are really two indicators of, um, of keeping deviance out of your life, um, of being able to get past that juvenile delinquency and being successful. Okay. This is everything. I've been saying to you over and over, um, so I'm not gonna, I told you that these slides sometimes, I apologize, get out of order. All right, so let's talk, and lastly, I think this is the last theory on develop, developmental, uh, maybe not, but um, we're close. So latent trait and propensity views. So personal traits, such as the genetic makeup, intelligence, body build, they operate in tandem with social variables that include poverty and family function, which together influence people to choose delinquency over non-delinquent behavioral alternatives. So here are some suspected latent traits that you guys can read over. and see that the propensity to commit delinquency is stable, but the opportunities fluctuates over time. There can just simply be fewer opportunities to commit crime. And so latent trait and propensity theory, it really integrates these trait theories with rational choice theory. So like making the choice to commit crime. So general theory of crime um, is Michael and Travis Hershey, and they're talking about the act and the offender as concepts, really. Um, so acts are committed when people perceive them to be advantageous. So if there is easy short-term gratification, then that would say they're advantageous, right? And so, <clears throat> This is moving through this idea, you know, delinquency is rational, it's predictable, and we know that delinquents are predisposed to commit crimes. Now remember, always you guys, theories, theories, theories. These are theories, not truths necessarily. Um, is there research to support them? Well, sometimes there is. Uh, if they're going to be lectured about in this class, I'd say yes, there is. Um, but remember that you know, you can believe or buy into one or all of these theories. I think it's somewhere in between all of these theories that you guys are learning about. So what makes people delinquency prone? So their level of self-control develops early in life and remains persistent into and throughout adulthood. And when people have limited self-control, they tend to be impulsive, um, insensitive to other people's feelings, physically aggressive. Maybe they're big risk takers. Don't look at the long term, look short sighted and nonverbal. Keep to themselves. Don't talk about their feelings. Um, they lack self-control. 
And so when we're testing these gen this general theory of crime, um, delinquent kids, we, we know this, delinquent kids score much higher on impulsivity tests than non-delinquents. And so that's a sign, you know, we're giving these delinquent kids and then these non-delinquent kids um, these tests on um, impulsivity and we're seeing that they are scoring higher. And general theory of crime also assumes that delinquent propensity does not change. The, oppor the opportunities change. And so if someone does fall into this general theory of crime and maybe is one of these ones that's higher on the impulsivity, what can we do to help build that social capital for that child, delinquent or not, to get them on the other side of the coin? So lastly, trajectory theory. And trajectory theory, it really the basic premise is that there's more than one path to crime and there is more than one class of offender. And so we have some different types. So we have violent delinquents and um, chronic offending. So first let's talk about, um, <clears throat> well, and then the pathways, authority conflict, covert pathway and the overt pathway. So um, the trajectory theorists recognize that delinquents may travel more than one road in their delinquent career. Some may be chronic, others may commit only once or twice, some increase their activity as they age, others will de-escalate. And there are three distinct paths to delinquent careers that have been identified. The first is the authority conflict pathway. And this begins at an early age with stubborn behavior. It leads to defiance and then to actual um, authority avoidance. <clears throat> the covert pathway begins with minor um, underhanded behavior and then it turns into more like property damage and gets into more serious forms of crime. And the overt pathway escalates to aggression and aggressive acts beginning with you know moderate aggression and then leads to physical fighting and then extreme violence. Okay, so where are we? I'm trying to. So here are some, um, here is a graphic that talks about um, Lower's pathways to crime, kind of talks about these different um, ages of onsets and some of the other um, behaviors that we see there. I want to make sure that you guys, we didn't, I didn't talk about this, abstainers. Um, so social introverts whose unpopularity shields them from the group pressure are pressure to commit delinquent acts. So abstainers are the kids who never really involved in typical misbehaviors, drinking, smoking, sex, petty crimes. Um, and so that kind of keeps them in their own little section. They are called abstainers. Okay, so let's briefly just talk about um, evaluating some of these developmental views. So um, there really is this um, proposal that a delinquent career must be understood as a path. There's got to be some sort of pathway. And a number of policy-based initiatives um, based on the developmental theory have emerged. And that includes um, giving parents the skills to help them improve their parenting, um, aiding kids who have entered delinquency, starting to introduce them to a life that follows conventional lines of behavior, and really developing multi-systemic programs that are designed for those at-risk youth and strengthens children's social and emotional competence. Um, and so we have to look at different ways to do this. And we know um, that we can integrate those into um, programming and understanding these developmental traits. So there is, gosh, I keep getting ahead of myself and I really apologize. So there are a couple different um, programs that your book talks about um, across ages. And, and this is a drug prevention program 
for use age 9 to 13, and it pairs mentors, older mentors, older adult mentors, with younger adolescents. And it's designed as a, a school and community um, program and um, has been really highly effective. But mentoring is really important. This is the summary page. Mentoring is something I want you guys to think about because really it is, is a cornerstone of a lot of these projects um, with youth and it's designed for at-risk kids. And they look at the personal, the social, the educational, family services, um, and they get in there and that is really important in the process of building social capital. All right, that does it for this chapter. Enjoy.